Okay, everyone. Um, I think we'll go ahead and begin because uh, we have a lot to talk about and we only have an hour to do it in. So just to say really quickly, hello and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and just for your information, the event is being recorded. Uh, I'd like to thank in particular Frontline Defenders and Smashing Times for including us in their ambitious arts and human rights program. And thanks to Ronan, our tech support person, and to Catherine Dunn for all her work behind the scenes. I am Leah Mills. I'm your chair for the evening. I'm a novelist, short story writer, essayist, and the current chair of Irish Pen, Pen Heron. Tonight, I'm going to give you a little background about Pen International and summarize the work Irish Pen has done in the 11 months since we relaunched the organization before turning the conversation over to our three participants. Maria McManus is a poet, a collaborative artist and artistic director of Quotidian, Word on the Street. Sophia Hillen is a novelist, short story writer and literary biographer. And Celia Defrenia is a poet, playwright, librettist, novelist and biographer who writes in both Irish and English, and she is Cahirlach of Impasna Scrutinori Gaelga. There are full biographies of the speakers on the festival website, and I'm not going to give them all because that would take the whole hour because of all their achievements. So our three speakers will talk about different aspects of their work with Irish Pen, Pen the Heron, as members of the Freedom to Write and No Small Talk subcommittees. But first, we're going to follow a long established pen tradition of the empty chair. At pen dinners and events, a chair is left empty to symbolize the absence of a writer who cannot be present because they have been imprisoned, disappeared, or killed. But tonight, we remember Daphne Caruana Galicia. And um, Viviana, can you share your screen? Thank you. But Daphne Caruana Galicia was a journalist and anti-corruption activist in Malta. She wrote extensively about corruption in Maltese business and government circles and received many death threats but got no police protection. On the contrary, she was labelled a nuisance and a crank. Numerous vexatious lawsuits were brought against her. Her bank accounts were frozen. Her dog was killed and left on her doorstep. Her house was subject to an arson attack and still she got no protection. Finally, she was assassinated in a car bomb attack on the 15th of October 2017. The government whose corruption she investigated repeatedly obstructed the path to justice for Daphne and her family, including by delaying a long awaited public inquiry into her assassination. Dozens of civil defamation lawsuits continued posthumously against her. Meanwhile, human rights defenders and journalists campaigning on her case have been subjected to serious pressure, harassment and acts of reprisal. So far, eight men have either admitted to or been charged with complicity in her murder. In July 2021, a landmark public inquiry found that the state bore responsibility for her murder. Malta, let me remind you, is an EU country. Penn International calls on the Maltese authorities to ensure full justice for all those involved in the murder of Daphne Caruana Galicia and the corruption she exposed. So now, before we move away from the empty chair, Celia Dufrenia will read a poem she wrote in both Irish and English for the Penn International Memorial Anthology for Daphne Caruana Galicia. Celia. Thank you, Leah. Um, just a brief introduction. In the Greek language, Daphne is the word for laurel. And in mythology, Daphne was turned into a laurel. And another fact then is that um, paper is made from the bark of laurel. Lauros, laurel. I givna er in memory of Daphne Corona Galitia. Shasan da heher godangan, igunya naguiha igongar. Igain, gentar pauper de the hurt, go gave neater the vrihra, i dexana jiaga. 
Your work stands firm against the wind hereabouts. In far off lands, paper is made from your bark that your words be preserved in sacred texts. Gurmagad. Thank you, Sina. Okay, so first I'm going to give a general introduction to Penn International and the work that they do. Um, and then I'll talk about Irish Penn specifically. The Penn International originated as a dinner club for writers founded in London by Catherine Dawson Scott in 1921 as Penn. It's an acronym for poets, playwrights, editors, essayists, novelists, and also includes journalists and historians. It was a network dedicated to promoting the role of literature in society and the idea of friendly exchange among writers of all countries. The movement grew quickly and spread to other countries. As the world darkened in the 1930s and tensions grew between national pen centers, John Goldsworthy, who was the president, wrote the first three articles of the pen charter, which was approved at the International Congress in Berlin in 1926. Um, and I just, I think it's worth reading those first three articles. First one is that literature knows no frontiers and must remain common currency among people in spite of political or international upheavals. The second says that in all circumstances, and particularly in time of war, works of art, the patrimony of humanity at large, should be left untouched by national or political passion. And the third is, members of Penn should at all times use what influence they have in favor of good understanding and mutual respect between nations and people. They pledge themselves to do their utmost to dispel all hatreds and to champion the ideal of one humanity living in peace and equality in one world. And the full Penn Charter, which was approved in 1948 is longer, but you can find it on the Penn International website. But during World War II, the principles of Penn crystallized into a defense of literature and writers against repression in all its forms. H.G. Wells became president after Goldsworthy's death in 1933, and he led a campaign against the burning of books in Nazi Germany. Then in 1939, Wells made a declaration of rights, which evolved into a book called The Rights of Man in 1940 which contained progressive ideas instrumental in the foundation of the United Nations. The idea that freedom of expression is a fundamental human right was picked up by President Roosevelt for his Four Freedoms speech in 1941. And the four freedoms were freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. So you can see that Penn International provided a, a seed for many important things that followed. During the war, Penn began to work to protect writers under threat from oppressive regimes. This evolved into what it is perhaps best known for today, letter writing campaigns, both to imprisoned writers and to governments protesting against their imprisonment. So the theme of this festival is hope, courage and resilience. And I'm just going to give you one example of the impact of Penn's work. At the recent Centenary Congress, which was held in September, Eno Mayo Messi from Cameroon testified about the impact Penn's work had on him, saying that he was free today thanks to Penn. He had been sentenced to seven years in prison, but Penn defended him. Members sent hundreds of letters, and after a few letters, he said, his conditions began to improve. Then his case went to the Court of Appeals, where his sentence was cut in half and he was released due to pen lobbying after three years. He is, he says, living, breathing proof of the efficacy of pen work. Letters and cards of protest have real and significant impact in any country. He said, your letters set me free. Your postcards broke my chains. The pen also works in partnership with ICORN, the International City of Refuge Network, and the Artists at Risk Connection. And just to summarize really quickly, ICORN is an independent organization of cities and regions offering shelter to writers and artists at risk, advancing freedom of expression, 
defending democratic values and promoting international solidarity. The protection team at Penn International's headquarters in London collaborate closely with ICORN on their work with writers applying to join the program, and many Penn centres support and help to host their local guest writer. ICORN member cities offer long-term but temporary shelter to those at risk as a direct consequence of their creative activities. And their aim is to be able to host as many persecuted writers and artists as possible um, and to form a dynamic and sustainable global network for freedom of expression. Um, membership of Penn supports the vital work carried out by regional coordinators who verify cases, secure consent from individuals and their families to run campaigns, they spread information and support local centres in their work. And that means they do a lot of fact checking, they compile statements, they collect signatures, and then individual pen centres sign up to statements, disseminate them locally, correspond with local and foreign governments and media, and do our best to promote the work of writers who are imprisoned or at risk because of their work. So Irish pen. We're unsure about the exact time of its original inception, but it has definitely been in existence since 1928. And early leaders were Sean O'Fallon and Lady Gregory. It's gone through several phases of interest during its lifetime and was prominent in the fight against censorship in the 1940s and 1950s. It came to prominence again around the time of the last economic crash and the committee became involved with the National Campaign for the Arts and held several information meetings of which some of you may have been present. Two years ago, the Freedom to Write campaign was approached by outgoing committee members of Irish Pen, which had been largely inactive for several years, and asked to take over running the committee. So first we had to establish membership and credentials with Pen International. We had to restructure the organisation, set up a not-for-profit company and a board. We relaunched as Irish Pen, Pen the Heron, an all-Ireland organisation in November last year. So we've only been in existence for 11 months so far. President Michael D. Higgins is our patron. We're an entirely voluntary organization, but we hit the ground running. We've done a lot of work in our first year and it's been an education for all of us. We continued the work that the Freedom to Write campaign had been doing, holding events to highlight the cases of imprisoned writers and crucially to showcase their work where possible so that their words are free in the world, even when they themselves are not. We established a strong collaborative network of pen centres in England, Scotland and Wales with the acronym WISE. All four centres think this is valuable in the context of Brexit and an uncertain future. We meet regularly to exchange information and ideas to support each other. We've worked on campaigns together and recently we held a joint multilingual in English, Irish, Welsh and Telugu event with the Scottish and Welsh centres in support of the Indian poet Varavara Rao, who's currently on medical bail from prison due to ill health having contracted COVID-19 in prison. Irish Pen will hold another such event on the 15th of November as part of the Dublin Book Festival, celebrating the work of Rao and the Kurdish poet Ilhan Sami Chomak, who was imprisoned in Turkey 23 years ago when he was a 22 year old student on charges he denies. Other writers we supported this year include Perhat Turshan, who is a Uyghur poet currently in prison somewhere in China, no one knows exactly where he is, and Paula Ugaz in Peru, a writer who is currently at risk. She's been enduring many lawsuits and she's now seen as the journalist who has had most uh, she's been sued the most often, more often than any other journalist in Peru, any other person, I think, in Peru. She's received death threats, but she continues to write. We also support English Pen's Pen Rights Campaign, and details of that campaign are on their website and on ours. We also work with other organisations in Ireland, like the Irish Writers' Union and Interest in Scrivori Gelga, as we'll hear in a little while, for campaigns and for events. We've held readings of the literary work of imprisoned writers and other writers' responses to that work. We've corresponded with our Department of Foreign Affairs about our concerns for certain writers and with foreign governments. We've done a certain amount of behind the scenes advocacy. We're part of a Turkey action group dealing with the rise of authoritarianism in that country. 
We ran a social media campaign in support of the successful case brought by the family of Margaret Keane to be allowed to have an inscription in Irish on their mother's headstone in a graveyard outside Coventry. Victory in that case was a victory not just for the Irish language, but for all minority languages in Britain. We're currently developing scholarships for writers living in direct provision. Uh, next month, we're going to have a write along event where members come together to write postcards and messages of support to imprisoned writers. Details of our work and our events go out to our members in a newsletter. So otherwise, generally, we educate ourselves about what's happening in other countries, and we try to stay alert to what's happening here. And you're going to hear more about all of that from our three panelists. So finally, working with English Pen, last year we convened a confidential roundtable discussion with other human rights organisations based in Ireland, Europe and North America to discuss threats faced by journalists in Northern Ireland. And we look forward to developing these links into the future. So now we're going to go to the poet Maria McManus, who will talk about the work of the Freedom to Write Subcommittee of Irish Pen. So Maria, before you tell us about the work of the subcommittee, could you say what freedom of expression means to you? And why do we need to think about it in Ireland? Thanks very much, Leah. Um, I, I suppose um, my own perspective on freedom of, of expression is, is quite multifactorial. Um, at some level, it is about congruence between my own lived life and, and my values, but also to have the right to be curious, to question, to become informed um, and to listen to the spaces in between. It doesn't mean that I have to uh, know and understand everything or, or ex ex express always um the right thing, I can be curious and uh, learn and grow with, with, with that. Um, it's also about having the right to challenge domination, oppression and aggression and to shape in some way the discourse of, of the progression of law towards a more just and equal world. Um, we have a right to silence, not an imposed silence, but to the peace to travel inwards to the self and to pay attention as a writer in solitude, uninterrupted, unopposed and unoppressed, to articulate our engagement with the world and report back truthfully and with integrity to progress thinking and imagination um, in service of a more just and equal wor world. So that for me is a kind of a broad brush to freedom of expression. It's a lot. Oh, I know. Big expectations. <laughs> if we were here for the whole life, we might be able to unpick some of it. Yeah. Could you tell us about the subcommittee work, the, the work that Irish Pen has actually been doing in relation to any of these issues? Great. Um, it, you, you know, in line with the three themes of courage, hope and resilience, I'm going to report back on three key strands of our activities. And if I start with the first one, um, and as I segue on from what you were talking about, our um, uh, focus on journalists here in the north, in a way, we are curious about that on, on two strands. Our journalists here have been um, subject both to um, pushback by the state, but also by organised crime and by paramilitaries. Um, so that's it's. So we are curious in terms of opening up the discussion about that. None of us and, and none of those international partners that we uh, joined in that confidential group to begin to unpick the issues came necessarily to clear conclusions, but there was a real spirit of um, collaboration, of a, a desire to bring different skill sets to understanding the complexity of that and, and develop an awareness of what is transferable um, from our particular context here to, uh, to other contexts. Um, uh, so uh, very, very interesting discussions um, opened up in, in not using Northern Ireland journalists as a case study. Um, the other two big initiatives that we're working on, one is the production of um, the poetry uh, jukebox uh, curation, The Revolution is in the Heart, a quote from KT, who is a Myanmar poet. Um, and we will put those public audio installations into 
public spaces, one outside the Crescent Arts Centre here in Belfast, and the other outside of the Epic Centre in Dublin um, in November, in time for to coincide with the, the um, Imprisoned Writers Day, and uh, have those audio installations out in, in public space with the words um, by Vara Vara Rao, Perha, Tershan, Paula, Ugas, uh, Keti, Kay Zawin, and Ilan Sami Chomak. Um, and uh, just celebrate their world uh, and celebrate their words and them as, as writers within that, but make their work more easily available. All right, those readings will also be available online, won't they? Yes, they will at quotidian.ie. But we'll put all that out in our um, in our uh, newsletter to Leonir at the, the time. The final strand of our um, work that is in development is a project called Right to Silence. And in this, and again, it was um, really yourself paying attention to what is it that we're not hearing and the dynamic of erasure of, um, in particular, the, the Uyghur poets, but really understanding that if that's happening in one place, it's going to be happening in other places as, as well. So we wanted to devise a project um, where we are uh, paying attention to erase, you're paying attention to silence. So that's in um, development at the moment as a form of hedge school and an opportunity to educate ourselves and uh, others about particular individuals, cases and political situations. So we will uh, launch that project in, in November or announce it in November and uh, run it in January as a public participation event where we can uh, creatively write into the silence and, and respond um, there as uh, with both individual and collective activism. Sounds fantastic. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Right. So, um, moving on to the No Small Talk campaign, which was set up independently of Irish Pen, but with overlapping concerns and membership, in response to increasingly hostile language being used in politics and media circles in the lead up to Brexit. Our work was so closely linked that No Small Talk became a subcommittee of Irish Pen soon after it relaunched. Just last month, for capacity reasons, we decided to suspend the work of this subcommittee, but we're going to talk about some of the work involved, much of which continues as part of the general remit of Irish Pen. I'll just read the mission statement of No Small Talk. Our aim is to initiate and facilitate a conversation among writers and artists of Ireland and Britain in order to strengthen the existing links between us. That work continues to recognize the various languages spoken on these islands, um, which work is also ongoing and Celia is going to talk about that, and to challenge the current public discourse that creates division and conflict. Our next speaker is novelist, short story writer and literary biographer, Sophia Hillen, who along with poet and publisher, Liz McSkeen, who I think is with us tonight, was a key contributor to a project addressing the increasing use of belligerent confrontational and even military language in the discourse surrounding Brexit. Sophie, you have a different angle on language issues related to conflict and confrontation. You've done some fascinating research. Could you tell us about it, please? Thank you, Leah, I'm very happy to. Yes, we, we did work, uh, all of us worked, a great deal of us, a uh, great many of us, uh, Catherine Dunn, Martina Devlin, Margot Gorman, you, uh, Celia and uh, Maria, uh, and Liz McSkeen. And we, we, we were, as, as you said, we were trying to see what we could do with language. We had a meeting in uh, 2019, which was about talking language, and that was in the Teachers Club in Dublin. And we were to have another called Changing the Script at the beginning in March 2020, but events took over and that couldn't happen because of the pandemic. But we were very concerned with what the script was to begin with. And one of the things we, we, were, we thought about was what, what Brexit did, the whole Brexit project, what it did to language, what the consequences were. Because first we had Trump style, we had three word slogans uh, and reminiscent of Orwell's Animal Farm. You know, we didn't have four legs good, two legs bad, turning into four, two, four legs good, two legs better. We had take back control. We had 
get Brexit done. And one of the early features of Brexit we noticed was that there had to be an enemy. And the designated enemy was Europe, who had been our partners for many, many years. The next thing we noticed was there could be no criticism of the project. And the increasingly military language enhanced that. Careless talk would cost lives, it was perfectly clear. And before very long, we were back in the Second World War. Each time there was to be an exit from the, from the EU, the, the BBC would schedule uh, such films as The Wooden Horse, The Dam Busters, in which we serve, all extolling the heroism of the little island nation standing alone against the forces of evil, which in the Second World War was seen as Germany. Now, that belligerent language we couldn't help noticing then segued almost seamlessly into the language of COVID. The new enemy was the beast. That was the, the beast to be wrestled to the ground. While the nation, sometimes with the nation, sometimes there were mysteriously four nations, but the nation embodied by Boris Johnson was to keep its foot upon the neck of the beast. While Ireland cocooned the vulnerable, uh, the UK shielded them, while uh, everybody was a member of a cohort. Anybody who was helping in any way was flocking to the colours, rather like the little ships at Dunkirk. Those required to stay off work were on furlough, which was a term, a military term for a soldier to be absent from duty. The staff of the NHS was on the front line. They were heroes, particularly if they died. So if you criticized, if anyone criticized the doctrine of Brexit and then COVID, they were being unpatriotic. What was very important about the language was the overriding, uh, the overriding significance of perceived dominance of defeating the enemy. And to emphasize the military style of this, there were briefings. Now, the curious thing about this, uh, this um, the bluster defined by the by the Oxford English Dictionary as which comes from the Old Norse. I'm sorry, I lost my place. The Old Norse for gale, and it's it's defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as boisterous, inflated talk, violent or angry self-assertion, noisy and empty menace, or swaggering. Curiously, when it came then, this then moved into the discussion on the protocol. Um, and as Fintan O'Toole pointed out, while Ireland, North and South was almost entirely overlooked in the Brexit calculations, the consequence for Ireland and the rest of the EU was enormous. And yet we had, once an agreement had been reached, we had the, the present Secretary of State denying the existence of the border, which the pro protocol was to speak about, and that, that the, the, the agreement would be broken, but only in a limited and specific way. It's very hard to imagine how you can break a law in a limited and specific way. And then when, they, when the protocol was to be overridden, um, again, there was, to, there was allowed to be no, no dissent. Now, in the middle of the centenary year, uh, a very controversial centenary, centenary year, the, uh, David Lord Frost, who is, the, who is the negotiator for all things Brexit, announced that we are being asked to apply a boundary through the centre of our country, which was at very best um, uh, insensitive to, to, to a place where there are so many, quite apart from the political, there are so many, um, so many sensitivities concerning the whole thing of the border. Can I ask, can I, sorry, can I interrupt you there for a moment to just talk about those sensitivities? Because I suppose what I'm interested about in the context of PEN is the focus on language and why did it matter if key figures in the media and politics were changing the tone of language that was used in general discourse to become as hostile and confrontational as it was. And I wonder, do you think the key is in those sensitivities or does it apply to civic life more broadly that tensions become inflamed very quickly when military terms and military ideology is brought into it? 
I, I think I think the latter, Leah, I think it's a very good question it was one I've been asking myself all day. The military language being used meant that, again, there had to be an enemy and the enemy had to be the protocol, the protocol which had been designed as a solution to a problem, the existence of which had been denied. Suddenly, the solution had to be the cause. The solution had to be the enemy. And that, that, is, that is ongoing as, as of this moment. The, it made me think, as I went along, it made me think of, it took me back to Lewis Carroll's rather sinister Humpty Dumpty. If you remember his scornful, arrogant assertion, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, which is to be master? That's all. The question is, which is to be master? And through the language, what seems to be happening is that the present government in the UK must be master of the narrative. And that war of words that begins over Brexit and then COVID, and the extraordinary view that's taken at present by the UK government that it has to mean what it says only in the moment of utterance or in the moment of signing, and that thereafter the presumed meaning can be dispensed with or replaced by something more convenient. I went back today thinking about this, not only to Lewis Carroll, but to Anthony Trollope in Barchester Towers, when he says, wise people, when they're in the wrong, always put themselves right by finding fault with the people against whom they have sinned. The art of doing this is among the most precious of those usually cultivated by those who know how to live. There is no withstanding it. But I think what we believe in no small talk and an Irish pen is that we must withstand it. If we're to move towards the language of conciliation, which is necessary to the accommodation of differences. And, and even you know, when we consider how this now familiar language of war is presently being applied to climate change, there's a code red, a clarion call to action against yet another enemy. We could remember, Rebecca Stott pointed out recently in the Radio 4, we have to remember what the story that the stories we tell ourselves matter. Yeah, and I, and I think that's what we have to do. Pay attention to the stories we allow ourselves to be told and which we tell ourselves. OK, and of course, for stories to be heard and to be really understood, they have to be spoken in a neutral, non-confrontational uh, sort of a way. But what, what you just said also raises the thorny issue of truth in an age of misinformation, um, yes. which is another thing that we all need to be concerned about. Um, on a personal level, uh, you know, what do we challenge, what do we let go unchallenged? I think it's really interesting that we think about that. Yes, I do. Conscious of the time, so I'm going to move on now. Maybe we can come back to that question at the end if we have any time. Um, thank you very much, Sophie, for that. And now one of the campaigns that Irish Pen worked on during this year, as I mentioned, was a social media campaign in support of the family of Margaret Keane to have an inscription in Irish on their mother's tombstone. On that campaign, we had the full support of the other wise pen centres and also the Irish Writers' Union and Aintusna Scrignori Gergen. Celia Dufresne, who's a member of the No Small Talk subcommittee, is Cahirlach of Aintusna Scrignori Gergen. As I said, Cecilia, well, first, can you tell us why freedom of expression is a concern in relation to translation and linguistic rights, which is a key focus for Penn International? You're on mute, I'm afraid. Yeah, thanks. I'm, as you correctly say, I'm the Cahir look of Aintus Nitzgrig Nori Gaeliga, but I'm here in a personal capacity, though I'm sure much of what I'll say, if not all of it, um, would be agreed on by members of uh, the Anglis. Um, yeah, freedom of expression is very important um, for the minority language, and um, Irish obviously is a minority language, and a translation of that language is very important. Also, if we want to our work to reach a wider audience, although writing in Irish, we are providing literature for um, for write for readers and school children and students of Irish, 
and we were happy. And um, I should say, ain't this not screen or again? Ilga was a voice to Irish language literature and to work in association with other organisations. And we were only too pleased to join with Irish Pen Pen the Heron in those campaigns, in particular the Margaret Keane campaign and in other, the Vavara Rao, um, and to, to sign our names to uh, the various petitions which were being spearheaded and organised by Irish Pen Pen the Heron. Thank you. Um, sh uh, shall I talk a little about the indigenous languages on this archipelago of islands, which was something that we all often touched in the talk? I should say, um, I I'll start by saying there are six Celtic languages still being spoken. Um, three of them are Q Celtic and three P Celtic. So the Q Celtic ones are. Irish, Scots Gaelic, and Manx, the language of um, the Isle of Man. And the other three are Cornish, Welsh, and Breton. So, um, so five of those languages are spoken on this archipelago of islands. Um, both Cornish and Manx had died out. And there, um, over 20 years ago, some parents on the Isle of Man got together and set up a school through which children are being taught um, their subjects um, in Man. UNESCO subsequently declared the language to be dead and the school children wrote to UNESCO and said, hang on a minute, it is not dead, it is the language of our school. Um, down in Cornwall, people got together with, I remember seeing a programme, they had what were called Xeroxes, just photocopies of words and they were beginning to speak and revive the language. So I think um, those actions are very much in keeping with um, courage, hope and resilience. Um, I think, you know, in Irish, there are certain kind of, you know, we're always looking for more um, Irish language speakers um, in the south of Ireland, shall we say, but as a writer, um, I, I, you know, I enjoy freedom of expression. I'm in a very privileged position. I have access to grants and bursaries and so on. And um, many of those are administered by Forest Nigeliga. Forest Nigeliga is a 32 county body which was established under the Good Friday Agreement. Now, the Good Friday Agreement uh, recognized committed to recognizing the importance and to respect and tolerate the linguistic diversity in the north of Ireland, including Irish and also Ulster Scots. Now, for, for years beforehand, many people would have regarded Ulster Scots as a dialect, but it is recognized as a language now. And then the in 2006, the St. Andrew's Agreement announced plans for an Irish Language Act, and this has not yet happened. And um, there is a campaign in the North organised by Conor Nigeliga, uh, Jarag Le Farag, uh, Red with Rage, which is agitating for this act and for people in the Northern Northern uh, through Irish that, for instance, um, Irish would be recognized as the language spoken in court or by government bodies and so on, and that street signs could be um, put up bilingually. So that's an ongoing, um, if you like, political football, although I don't like those kind of terms, but that's how it has been described. And Arlene Foster at one stage said, if you feed a crocodile, they will keep coming back for more. So at these protests, these Jarek Lafaric protests, you will always see guys in crocodile suits. And that's what all that is about. Um, Irish in, in the North is often associated with um, nationalism, republicanism, Catholicism, but it's a language that belongs to everyone and it belongs to the Protestant community also. And 
Linda Irvine would be very prominent in uh, setting up, uh, she set up a, a kindergarten there recently, and her work was recognised by the Queen of England, who awarded her an MBE. That's, uh, yeah, so fantastic. I have to give a background to the Indigenous languages. Yeah, um, and uh, actually, I was in the north. Uh, we just came back yesterday. We were in County Down, and I was struck by the number of street signs that are there actually in both languages now at this point. Not everywhere. No. Um, but certainly they weren't there years ago. Um, yeah. so that's a pause. Um, what do translation opportunities mean for writers? So translation is something that Penn International is very big on. Uh, how important is it to be able to be read in other languages, do you think? Um, I think, you know, years ago, Irish language writers might have been frowned upon if they were having their work translated into English, because, you know, there used to be this idea that if you were for Irish, you were against English, which is a very stupid um, idea. Um, I my poetry, I usually translate it myself, and um, it it get it ha, it reaches a far wider audience. And um, in fact, much of the critical work that's written on, on my work and on the work of others is written by people who who are working on the English translation who don't have any Irish. Um, I feel I've I, I've sort of I have a novel coming out now. It's in Irish, and in a sense, um, you know, it's great. I'm delighted and all, but I don't think it will be translated into English. So it will really have a far a far smaller reach. But you know, it it hopefully will reach the people it is intended for. It is intended for young adults, and hopefully um, it will reach those and it will make an impression on them. Okay, and congratulations on the novel. Um, I'm a great believer in the dual language format for poetry collections, I have to say, because I think it works both ways. I think it's a gateway into the Irish language for people who maybe just have a little bit of Irish, but wouldn't be confident enough to buy an entire collection in Irish. But if you read the translation page, and then it, it gives you a way in. And um, so I would just like before leaving you, Celia, I just want to say that in 2008, uh, Penn International ran an international poem relay, which protested the Chinese government's imprisonment of the poet Shi Tao. Mm -hmm. And following the principle of the Olympic torch, a series of translations of the poem June were written and read. And Mehev was Celia's Irish language version of that poem June. Could you read it for us now, Celia? Can you read it in English yeah. or Chinese Irish? Yes, indeed, uh, Leanne. I should say it was a great honour for me to be asked by Penn to translate it into Irish. And at the time, 2008, the Olympic torch didn't actually come to Ireland, but it came to London. And uh, there was a website um, on which the torch was lit in the various countries through which it was travelling. And when it came to London um, on the website, uh, the poem was recited in Irish, English, Welsh and Scots Gaelic. Um, I'll actually I'll read it in English first because um, Leah, I think you know people who read poetry bilingual uh, collections, they often say that, gosh, I didn't realise I had so much Irish, and uh, sometimes I'm asked to read the English first because then people understand more of the Irish people who aren't completely fluent. Okay, June. Everyone avoids June. June, when my heart died, when my poetry died, when my lover died in the blood pool of romance. June, when the sun cleaves my skin, revealing the truth of my wound. June, when the fish escapes from the blood pool in search of peace. June, that deforms the earth, silences the rivers, piles up letters that cannot be delivered to the dead. Mehev, Shachnian on sale, Mehev, Mehev nor a deg mochri, nor a deg mochud filiakta, nor a deg mulanon, 
if will lin a romance yakta mehav in a sculchen on a green mokraken a knockta irina mokana mehav in a nailian on tisk aston vil aston will yakt the fish of a lorog mehav a ye common on a crina a volavian no heineke a harnan literica knock fager a shakata erna morrow thank you Thank you very much, Thank you very much, Sir Mahogat. Okay, um, the recent Peng Congress hosted an interview between Margaret Atwood and the Egyptian Canadian novelist Omar El Akkad, and they discussed the view that hope is an attitude and that writers can make a difference through their work, that individual efforts can affect change. Maria, would you agree with that? I hope, I hope uh, Leah, it's not too trite also to say that sometimes hope uh, is a thin emotion. And the only way that we can remain engaged is to act on things that are within our gift. And I think that that's, it's, hope is both kind of incredibly delicate and fragile. Um, and at the same time, it's uh, got this other characteristic as well as something that will pull us through in the way that Margaret Atwood um, and Omar are describing there. So I think it's it's kind of got that du du duality of um, presence in a way. Do you think that writers can make a difference through their work? Is there a conflict between doing the kind of activist work that you're all involved in, that we're all involved in, and writing as an art, as an artistic practice. Do you ever feel torn by that? I personally, uh, I just do the work and sometimes it has a consequence beyond and a, an impact beyond what I may intend or want for it or have hope for or any of those things. I mean, we have to believe that it has meaning, um, but we can't predict that and you can't predict how it lands nor how it travels from you to another person, the life it has. Okay. Um, you can only you can only give it what you've got. Fair enough, fair enough. Sophie, same question for you. Do you think that writers can make a difference through their work? Do you think it is any other writer's business to go trying to make a difference? I do. I do. Um, I was just thinking about when you're talking about what hope means. Uh, the definition I like best is, and I hope I'm quoting this correctly, comes from Václav Havel. And he talked about hope not as something which not as being worthy because it might have a chance to succeed but just because it was right and brothers Maria said if I'm writing something and if I feel that it is right that this is the right thing for me to be working on and if it feels true then then I think yes that is worthwhile and I do also agree that it, it may have a life beyond itself it may have consequences beyond itself that I can't see. But if I feel while I'm doing it, I feel this is what I should be working on. And if I feel that kind of rush of um, energy that is necessary to go through it, then, um, then I, I think I have that kind of hope that Havo talks about that because it is right, maybe that, that embodies hope. Okay, thank you, Celia. Uh, you're muted. I keep, I obviously press it on. I think it was Adrian Rich who in hand is a political act. And I often thought that, you know, starting out as a writer, because I think um, some of us here are, are, many of us are particularly women writers of a certain age, what we were doing was in a sense a sense of political act because we were going, we were breaking down boundaries, we were writing, um, we were the challenges facing us were 
far then were far greater than any challenges facing any women writers now. In a sense, we were paving the way. So I think that unbeknownst to ourselves, we you know we were just getting on with the work, but we, we were doing that. And um, can I interrupt you for a yeah. second because we have a question from the chat. Catherine Dunn is asking if you hoped to challenge the people of Ireland with your work, Pia Kafala. I didn't, I just, I wrote that. I didn't set out to cha uh, challenge anyone and it was sort of putting a national um, scandal or travesty on record. And when the book came out, I wanted it to be treated like that. This is a travesty in which an Irish government agency uh, knowingly infected 1600 Irish women with hepatitis C. Um, and at the time, you know, I kept being asked, is it about you, is it about you? Whereas, you know, I was insisting this, this is um, a national, it's a book about a national disaster, if you like. Okay, okay, fair enough. Listen, I'm, I'm really sorry, but we're almost running out of time. So can I really quickly ask you, um, do you have any publications coming up or what are you currently working on? And that question to Celia first. Um, the, Dara Rawa. It's a young adult book and um, that's due from Lower Core. And I also have a poetry collection, Daunta Gina Galasala Lockdown Poems in Search of a Horizon, Lace Lena Alaric, and that's forthcoming from Ireland House. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sophie? Uh, well, at, at the moment I'm, I'm working on some new short stories and I'm also working on updating the, the, the uh, Melu and Cass, Jane Austen's nieces in Ireland because new material has come to light. So I have a new one that takes that story right up to, interestingly for me, uh, the, the 1921 and the border uh, in which the family had something to say. So these are seven women of her family. So working on that at present. Okay, fantastic. And I believe you're also working on completing an essay based on the research you did for the most part. Uh, Yes, I am, and I'd hope for publication of that. And I okay. think you yourself may also be involved in that, Leah. I might indeed. <laughs> okay, Maria, you? Um, uh, I have a couple of projects coming to conclusion at the minute. One that ha has just uh, um, gone out in this past week is called Epilogue, which was a collaboration I'd written the script, the poetry script for. It was a collaboration with the dancer uh, and choreographer Eileen McClory and the filmmaker Conan McIver. And we have more or less the same creative team working on a new um, film, which will go out next month called Bind, um, which is a celebration of the 250th anniversary of the amazing um, Robinson Library in Armagh and again that's poetry, um, dance and uh, a film with an original score by Katie Richardson and the only other thing then sitting out there is a collaboration with Keith Atchison who's composer um, who, um, we're working on a libretto for a thing about the Armagh Observatory I, secretly I wish I was from Armagh I'm not but I wish I was you know <laughs> Well, you know, you're all so busy and I think it's wonderful to realise that people can be involved in activism and doing so much good work and at the same time still continue with your literary lives, which is really, really important. Um, and just to wrap up really quickly um, and say to people who might wonder what you can do to support Penn International um, and Irish Penn in particular, join your local Penn Centre. Um, inform yourself about the work that they're doing. Um, we have a website, which I believe the details have all been put in the chat that you can go to, you can see what we do, you can apply to join. It's open to writers and readers and people who care about literature, no matter what. Um, the only stipulation is that you must subscribe to the principles of the Penn Charter in order to become a member or an associate member. Um, you can also visit the websites of Penn International, English Penn, look up the writers who they are sponsoring at the time and get involved in writing to people who are in prison. It's a chance to make a difference in one person's life or you can work on a broader campus. And it's also a chance to support democracy in a time of crisis, which I believe we are all currently in. And just a last word to take away with you 
it's a question, and we asked this question at the end of our launch last November. What does democracy mean to you? And how do you see that it might be under threat at the moment? And if it's under threat, what do we all need to do to protect it? Thank you all very much. Thank you for your time, for your attention. And again, thank you to Frontline Defenders and Smashing Times for including us in this festival. And to Catherine Dunn for all her work behind the scenes and to Ronan for keeping us all online. So thank you very much. Enjoy your evening.